Have you ever looked at your life and thought, one day, one day if I work just a little bit harder, one day when things start to align, one day when I make a little more money, one day when I finish college, one day when I complete that home project, one day when we get through this season, one day when my kids are a little older, one day, one day, one day, then. Have you ever thought that? Have you ever said that? I know I have many times. Many of us, I believe, many of us believe that in order to achieve, in order to win, in order to succeed, what we need to do is more. But what if it's actually the exact opposite? What if the opposite were true? What if, uh, what if for us to really do something significant, it's not about us doing more with our lives, it might actually be about us doing less with our lives? Where's the balance in this? Where's the balance in the tensions of all the things that we have going on in life? If you're anything like me, man, you've got things going on everywhere. You've got plates spinning. You've seen the old cartoons when the, the, the circus act, they got the plates spinning on their fingers and toes and hands. If you're anything like me, that's where you're at. And we find ourselves, if you're like me, trying to find balance. But is balance, that word, is balance even real? Can we really balance between what is and what we hope to be? Or are we just subject to living our lives based off of the circumstances and consequences of the things that happen around us? How do we know when it's time to push or when it's time to pull? How do we know when it's time to say yes or when it's time to say no? When are we supposed to give and when are we supposed to take? When are we supposed to go hard and when do we just sometimes need to just go home. In this series, we're actually going to be looking at the cost of living life at the pace and the speed of busy. And so many of us, man, I think we've got so many things going on. And I think if we're not careful, if we're not careful, us being overcommitted will actually lead to us underachieving. Let me say it again. I think if we're not careful, us being overcommitted actually has a possibility to leading to us underachieving God's promise, God's potential, God's purpose for our lives. And so in this conversation, in this series, Push or Pull, we're going to look at four different areas over the next few weeks. Here's the first area that we're going to be looking at next week, actually, is the topic of family. I believe that in this, um, this, this life of busyness, this life of committedness, man, if we're not careful, our family will have a cost. Our can't, family will pay a price. And it's difficult, I believe, it's difficult for us to be intimate and have deep, meaningful relationships with the people we love if we're too busy to talk, if we're too busy to have real conversations. And some of you that are married, maybe you've got kids, you, you, you know I, exactly what I'm talking about. Date nights for you aren't even really date nights. They, be, they turn into like these family life crisis management meetings where you and your spouse are just trying to figure out how are we going to do this, how are we going to get there, how are we going to do this. And what falls at the wayside and what pays the penalty can sometimes be our family. We're also going to talk in this series about finances. And I find this is really interesting. Marketing and research companies have proven that we make our poorest financial decisions between the hours of 9 p.m. and 10 p.m. every day. There's a reason that all of the TV channels after about 10 o'clock switch over to those infomercials. There's a reason that when we see these commercials pop up or you get emails late at night, there's a reason for it. Because they know when you're tired, when you're, when you're wore out, when you're trying to maybe even self-gratify, you're like, man, I deserve something nice after this hard day. You're thinking, I'm going to buy that thing on Amazon. I'm going to buy that thing. Or if you're old school, maybe QVC. Maybe you've bought a few things on there before. There's a reason that those infomercials hit up late at night because they recognize when we're moving at such a pace, we make poor financial decisions. The next thing we're gonna talk about in this series is our faith. We're gonna be talking about how the pace of our lives and the push and the pull and the overcommitting, how that can actually lead to us underachieving in, the, in, the, in issues and the, the, the categories of our faith. And then our last one, and this is what we're gonna be talking about today, is flow. Flow, what do I mean by that? Flow, I mean the rhythms of life. I believe that God has given us insight on how to have healthy 
rhythms. I believe there's a certain amount of pace and a certain amount of energy and a certain amount of, of, of exhortation of just moving forward with our lives. That's actually a good thing. But then there's also a time where maybe we should slow down just a little. In fact, I'm going to use a four-letter word here today. And so if you're, if you're maybe not comfortable with it, maybe plug your ears, but I want you to read the screen because it's not maybe the four-letter word that you're thinking of. And this is a four-letter word that I believe that probably is offensive to many of you. And I know it's offensive to me at times. And so I'm going to put this on the screen. But I believe this word, I believe the reason I'm calling it a four-letter word is because I believe this word actually hurts people. And I believe it maybe hurts you too. And here's a four-letter word that I believe everyone struggles with, busy. Busy. Man, I believe that so many of us are so busy that we don't even recognize the cost of our pace. We don't recognize that as we're moving through our lives at such a pace, as we're moving through our lives with so much speed and so much adrenaline and trying to be so busy and trying to do so many things, I don't think we realize the cost at which that comes. And so most of our problems of life, I believe, are actually caused by moving too fast for too long, filling every minute of every day with something. And in fact, why, I think there's a reason, I think there's two reasons why we love busy, and there may be more, but there's two I want to show us today, why we love being busy. Because I think maybe, if you would be a little bit honest today, maybe you're addicted to busy, like me. Why do we love to be busy? One, I believe that we like to be busy because busy makes me feel important. Busy makes me feel important. When I'm busy, I feel like I have control over my life when it's completely full. When my calendar is full, when my schedule is full, I can look at it and say, I have control. I am important. My life matters. And so I think some of us, men, we like to be busy. We like to fill our calendars. We like to make sure every day has something in it. In fact, maybe some of you are even addicted to that. You go into your calendars, and maybe I've done this maybe a time or two, where even like the day after some things have happened, you go back and add what you did that day so you can look at your calendar and go, wow, look at all the important things I did yesterday. Have you ever done that? Just be honest. I've done that several times. Like, I've already done these tasks. I'm already on the next day, but then I go to my calendar and actually write those things in there just so I can feel important. Or maybe you've even done it with a to-do list, like when you make this big to-do list, and then you, as you're making the to-do list, you're remembering things that you've already accomplished this week, but to make you feel more important, you want to make sure to add those things to the to-do list, even though they're already completed. I don't know if you're like me, but I do that all the time. Busy makes me feel important. What else does busy do? Busy lets me hide. When I'm busy, I get to hide. Some of us hate silence. Is that awkward? It's awkward in here. I don't know if it's awkward in your home. Some of us, we hate silence. We hate stillness. Why? Because it forces us to come face to face with the reality of what's really going on in our lives. So as long as I'm busy, as long as my mind is pinging and I've got ideas and pressure and stress and anxiety and things going this way and that way, as long as that's what's going on, I can't really, I don't have to, I don't have the time to really look at myself and go, this isn't healthy, this isn't good. Maybe I can do a little better here. Maybe I should do a little less of that. Maybe I should go to the gym. Maybe I shouldn't eat ice cream late at night. All these different things. But as long as I'm busy, I don't really consider myself and I don't really concern myself with those things because I've got something left to do and it's important. So busy, it lets me hide from who I really am and what's really going on in my life. So here's a truth that's going to set someone free today. Are you ready? This isn't in the notes. It's not on a slide. But this is a truth that's going to set someone free today. It can happen without you. That's the truth. I know it's, your, your mind is blown right now. It can happen without you. It can all the things that we think, man, if I don't do this, it won't happen. It can happen without you. Here's another truth that's going to set you, through, set you free. All right, this, this is good preaching right here. Here's another truth that's going to set you free. If it doesn't happen, it's okay. So it can happen without you. 
I believe that. And a lot of times we carry this pressure that I've got to go. I've got to carry this. I've got so much to do. There's so many different things going on. It's my responsibility. If I don't do it, then it's not going to happen. Here's the truth. It can happen without you. And if it doesn't, it's okay. And so many of us, though, we're so concerned with making it, we're so concerned with more that we keep filling up our lives, we keep being more and more busy. And what if the key to actually achieving more, to having more, to finding ourselves in a healthier place is not more, but actually less? See, most of us want more in our lives, but catch this, most of us want more in our lives, but our lives are so full, there is no more room for more. You see, most of, I think most of us, we do. We want more. We want better faith, better families. We want better uh, finances. There's different areas in our life that we want more out of, yet we want more out of it, yet we don't have any room for anything more because we're so busy. Do you have margin in your life for more? If God wanted to do something more in your life, do you have room for it? If God were to open up some opportunities for you, so if God were to, to open up some potentials for you, if there was going to be some things that in your life, if there's going to be some things that in your life that God wanted to do, if God had some more for you, do you have margin for it? Do you have the space for God to do more in your life? You see, I think so many of us, man, we, 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 we want more, but we've filled our lives up so much to the point there's no room for more. Let's look at this story from 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 4, it says, Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha. So the last few weeks we've kind of been talking about Elisha and Elijah. And I love this. It says, One of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. So this, this lady, this household, this family, they owed so much that the only way for them to pay it back was for the, this creditor to actually come and take her only two sons. She's already lost her husband, and now she's about to lose her son, and she's crying out to Elisha and saying, I need some help. I, I, I need something to happen in my life. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? <laughs> that seems kind of an obvious question. I love when prophets and characters of the Bible ask these obvious questions. What, what, what do you need me to do? Tell me, and then he, he says this, tell me, what, you, what do you have in your house? And she said, your servant has nothing in the house except. Man, I love this right here. Your servant has nothing in the house except. I think so many of us, we get caught up on what we have or don't have. Or, man, if I can one day when I get this, one day when I achieve this, one day when I finish this, one day when I finish college, one day when I have a little more time. And we think of all this like once I get more, then... But here's what's about to happen in the story. It says, she had nothing in her house except, I wonder, can God do more with your except than your more? Like, if, if we can be honest with ourselves about where we're really at, God, this is all I have. This is all that I am. God, I, I'm not great. I'm not perfect. In fact, I'm just average. But God, is it possible that you could do more in my life? Is it possible that I could see you do more in my life? She had nothing in her house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one vessel is full, set it aside. And so she went from him and she shut the door behind herself and her sons and she poured, poured the, um, and as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. So she's filling up these vessels. She's got one vessel and she just keeps pouring it. Before there was nothing there, now all of a sudden as she's pouring, it just keeps continuing and filling these vessels, these pots up with oil. And when the vessels were full, all that her sons had gathered and brought into the house, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. You see, this is an incredible story of how God is working a miracle to provide for this mother and her sons. But there's a couple hidden gems here that I, I want to show you in this story that I think can maybe help you and help us in this conversation. And here's the first one. You don't know what you have until you pour it before God. You don't know what you have until you pour it before God. She said, I don't have anything except this jar. 
And in that jar, it was empty. And the prophet told her to go gather up all the empty jars from your neighbors and your friends and families. And so now there's this pile of empty jars to shut the door. So they're in the house. It's the prophet, this widow, and her sons, and a pile of empty jars. And the prophet tells her, start to pour. Start to pour. Take what you think is nothing. Take what you think is not that valuable. Take what you think is empty and start to give that and let's see what happens. You see, I think so many of us are saving the potential of our lives. We're saving the purpose of our lives for when we have more time. Like we, we want to do something significant for God. We want to, our lives to matter, but we're saving it for when there's a time when I've got a little more time, a little more energy, a little less to do, when our career's in a certain spot, when I have maybe some more money, when baseball season's over, or football season's over, or volleyball season is over, when that stuff happens, then I'll have something to offer God. But you don't know what you have until you start pouring it, until we start giving it. What if we're never meant to give God our leftovers, but just meant to give God all? Like all of it, even if it's not that much, even if it's an empty vessel, even if it's an empty jar. You see, God wants us to be real with him. He wants us to, to put our life out there and to see what he can do through you. And in fact, I, I love that. I, I say that often to myself at, at home. I, I've got a little chant I say to myself, and I say, see what God can do through you. See what God can do through you. And I actually, I say that often at my house. I say that, see what God can do through you. And it's not a pep talk, like a pride, kind of like jumping, exciting kind of pep talk. It's more of a, God, I'm not that, like I say this to myself when I'm feeling insecure. I say this to myself when I'm feeling like I, I, I'm not good enough at something. I'm not good enough preaching. I'm not, I don't pray enough or I don't, I don't have enough or this isn't going how I want. When I'm feeling insecure, this is something I say. See what God can do through you. What if we bring him our empty vessels? What if we say, God, this is all that I have and I'm going to pour it out before you. What if we did that? And what will God do? Let's look at the second thought for us today. If you don't come empty, you can't be filled. If you don't come empty, you can't be filled. See, God wants to do immeasurably more than we can think or imagine. That's in Ephesians. It says, but some of us, if God wants to do immeasurably more than we can think or imagine... Some of us, that sounds great, but the reality is we've not made room for God to do more because our lives are so full. Like we're so busy, we got so many things. You're like the, the guy with the plate, you're spinning the plates, and you got so many things going on. And maybe even from time to time, you stop and you ask God, God, would you do something? God, I need you. And God goes, I want to. Where's a crevice? Where's a nick? Where's a cranny? Is there some little spot somewhere where I can get in and do something significant? But we filled our lives up, we filled our hearts up, we filled our pocketbooks up, we filled our calendars up so much to the point that if God wanted to do something, there's not any space for him. And we come and we try to maybe give them an hour on Sunday occasionally from here, this time or this time. Maybe you're watching online and maybe this is the first time you're hanging out with us and I'm so glad that you are. And this is a, definitely a part of it. But is there something more than just maybe this little piece of this? What if God wanted us to give him an empty, broken vessel? Matthew tells us this. He says, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little and so I'll set you over much. See, God's not looking for you to like be an all-star. You don't have to be some celebrity Christian. You don't have to be the best there ever was and the best there ever will be. God's not looking for you to hit a bunch of achievement marks and a to-do list. This is what God's looking for you, to be an empty vessel. God is just looking for someone that says, God, this is all that I am. This is all I have to offer. I'm not that great. I'm not that good. But what I do have, God, I give to you. And I believe when we do that, when we're faithful with the little, we say, God, I'm just a little guy. I don't have that much, but I'm going to give it to you. And this is what God says. If you would just give me a little, if you would just come empty, if you would just come as a broken vessel, if you would just come and say, I've got some space, God, this is all that I am. Would you do something significant? Would you move in my life? Would you use me to make a difference? God comes through and he always does it. In fact, God does his greatest works through the littlest people. 
through the people who made huge mistakes, people like Moses, who was a murderer and an outcast, God chose to do something incredible through. People like uh, 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 David, who had an affair and was also a murderer, God chose to do something incredible through him. Noah was a drunk, God chose to do something incredible through him. Peter was an agitator and asked way too many questions, yet God chose to do something significant through him. God chooses regular people who come before him empty with their little and says, God, this is all I have. And God comes alongside that and does some significant things. And he can do that with you today. You see, there's a blessing, I believe, of more for the good and the faithful with the little. If we want God to do more, then maybe we just need to be faithful with the little. In fact, John said it like this. He said, God, more of you and less of me. It's a really simple way to put it. You see, God is not limited to the size of your pot. This is how cool God is. He's only limited to the size of your willingness to present yourself empty. God's not limited to the size of your pot. He can fill it up. He's only limited to, the, to your willingness to present yourself empty. And here's our third and closing thought for today. We've got to create some margin for empty. We've got to create some margin for it. In this series, push and pull is this whole idea of, and, and the whole premise of it is when we overcommitted and we underachieve, when we, when we try to do this and we try to do this and we find ourselves in between trying to balance, trying to manage, and just trying to survive, I believe there's something more that God wants to do. But for us to do that, we actually may need to do a little less. I believe that there's some more, and we say that again, I believe there's some more that God wants to do in your life, but for God to do that, you might need to do a little less. We need to create some margin for empty. See, in this story, it says, the last verse says, when the oil stopped, when the oil stopped, the oil stopped when they ran out of empty vessels. The oil stopped when they ran out of empty vessels. You see, years ago, this is probably like six years ago, yeah, about six years ago, I was stuck, I was fixed, I was fascinated on becoming a worship leader. Like I thought that was like God's call on my life and I was leading some worship and doing some creative things and some different stuff, but I just kept coming up against the wall. I wanted, I, I, I had these dreams to do more, to like, to write some songs and to have a band and to do some different things. And you're like, really, John, do you? Yeah, really. And in fact, I did write some songs. And if you're a really good friend, I might let you listen to them, but they're not out for public consumption. <laughs> they're not that good. Um, but I tried. You know, I just kept fighting and I kept pushing and I kept pursuing, trying to achieve, trying to push through, trying to get something more from my life. And I never could do it. I kept fighting. I kept asking God, why? Maybe you've asked those kind of prayers before. God, why? I'm, I'm serving you. God, I show up to church. God, I, I'm generous. Why won't you come through? Why won't you meet me here? Why won't you do something, something significant in my life? And so I came to a place, I was just at the end. I was, I was at the end of this, this journey. And I, I made up in my mind, I was done fighting. I was done pushing. I was done trying to achieve. I was done trying to achieve my dreams. I was just going to submit it to God. I was just going to come before God empty and as an empty vessel and say, God, just do what you want. And so I did that. I came before God and I, I, I got on my knees. I remember it very vividly. I went to, the, to our church and I got on my knees right before the stage where I often would take the stage to lead worship. And I got on the stage, I got on my knees, except not on the stage, in the altar, and I said, God, this is yours. This is your platform. God, this is, this is your stage. God, this is your word. God, this is your church. And I am just here to do what you want me to do. I will tell you, it was a broken time for me because I knew in that moment, I wasn't just saying, God, I want to do what you want me to do. I was also saying, God, I'm done trying. And so I did. I, I took from that moment and that broken prayer and that broken moment, I got up. And I went to my house and I, I, I gave away everything. I had recording equipment, I had guitars, I had all kinds of stuff. I gave away everything. I wasn't gonna sell it. I wasn't interested in making money. I wanted to help someone else achieve their dreams. And in fact, one of 
my guitars I gave to a, just a young worship leader who now leads worship for thousands regularly. And I found it just so humbling that that moment, that transition actually played a part in his story. But I did, I just got rid of it all. And I, I told God, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. I'm, I'm not gonna keep doing this and I'm just gonna submit to you. About two or three weeks later, my pastor came up to me and says, John, I wanna start a college service. I've got this idea to start a college service and I think you would be great at leading it. And he asked me, he says, I, but to do it, I need you to preach. I need you to bring the word. And I said, I've never preached a message in my life. That's not what I do. And he says, I think you can do it. I think you'd be good at it. And I said, okay, I, I'll give it a shot. I, I'll preach this message. And so I got up just about five years ago and preached my first message ever to a group of college students. And I have to apologize if you're watching in the room because it was not a great message and it lasted forever. I could not figure out how to close the thing down. It was bad. But what I didn't recognize and what I didn't realize is that when I finally stopped and I sat down, when I came before God empty, when I said, God, it's not my will, not my way. God, it's not more of what I want. God, it's just more of you and less of me. When I did that, when I surrendered myself, when I came before God empty, this is what God did. He filled me up, but with something new. See, God had a different dream in mind. God had a different potential in mind. God had a different purpose in mind than what I could even see, more than what I could think or dream or imagine. But what it took was for me to take my hands off the wheel, for me to, to come before God empty and said, God, just do what you wanna do. And when I did that, God did something significant. In fact, the reason that we're here today, the reason that you're watching online today, the reason I'm up here preaching the gospel, the reason I live in Wichita, Kansas, is because at one point in my life, I finally had enough of trying to do everything on my own. I finally had enough of pushing and pulling. And I said, God, I'm done. I'm sorry. God, take me for how I am. This is all I have, an empty, broken vessel. So today, I've got a question for you. What are you going to say no to so you can say yes to Jesus? What are the things in your life, and maybe right now you're, your mind is already racing, the things in your life you need to say no to so you can say yes to Jesus? So you can come before God empty and say, God, what is it that you want? God, how can I serve you? God, I'm empty, I'm little, but God, I believe you can do something significant. Let's take just a moment today and create a little bit of margin for some empty.